Hello, it's Miguel. How are you doing, Emily? How are things so far? How's your day going? Thank you for clicking on that link. <laughs> Appreciate it. Let's spend some time together learning about one another and what's important to both of us and um, what's going on in the moment. Well, what's going on in the moment is uh, we're all adapting to daylight savings time ending. <laughs> That's right. It's uh, today's November 5th, the day after daylight savings time ends. And indeed, yesterday was a day with very little sunlight. <laughs> and I noticed it. Yeah, it's funny. It's around... Um, 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. in the evening and you know I expect there to be just a little bit of sunlight and there was basically none out <laughs> and it's like okay where'd the sun go it's kind of funny how human beings play with time and uh, how we try to optimize time to do certain things how we change our clocks around you know Stonehenge uh, you know, the astronomers who worked with Stonehenge, I'm not sure they had a, a, a Stonehenge that was an hour ahead and a Stonehenge that was an hour behind. <laughs> I don't think the, uh, the ancients thought, uh, thought about doing this kind of activity that we do. You know, I think it's fine to certainly optimize how we manage our day and the time and the clocks and, um, and when I'm up and out of bed, I want to see as much sunlight as possible. <laughs> That's the goal I think we're all trying to optimize. And uh, anyway, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're handling the time change effectively. Um, I haven't had any trouble with my sleep at all, so I'm thankful for that. Yeah, and um, I'm excited about Thanksgiving coming up. And... Um, well, I think we'll start off our session like we usually do, and that is by reading a passage from Mary McKenzie's book, Peaceful Living. Today is November 5th, and the quote for the day is a quote by Louisa May Alcott. And the quote is, Far away, there in the sunshine, are my highest aspirations. I may not reach them, but I can look up and see their beauty, believe in them, and try to follow where they lead. This is a beautiful passage. I'll read it again by Louisa May Alcott. In fact, I'm not quite sure who Louisa May Alcott is. I think she's a writer. Maybe she wrote Little Women or something like that. Hey Google, who is Louisa May Alcott? According to Wikipedia, Louisa May Alcott was an American novelist and poet best known as the author of the novel Little Women and its sequels Little Men and Joe's Boys. <laughs> what do you know about that? My brain figured it out. Yep. Uh, the author of Little Women and Little Men. Uh, both books that I haven't read. <laughs> but somehow I know that. How do I know that? I'm not sure. So, uh, quote. Here it begins. Far away there is... There in the sunshine are my highest aspirations. I may not reach them, but I can look up and see their beauty, believe in them, and try to follow where they lead. So this is a beautiful passage. I love this quote because it really does exemplify the essence of what having a value is. You know, it's about sort of looking forward to a goal that might be possible and, um, or impossible, <laughs> you know, values. For example, patience is a value and it's quite uh, effective and useful in our everyday. And it is a word that describes an in undetermined amount of time. <laughs> you know, a person's patience can span 10 years, 20 years, uh, or two minutes. <laughs> it's unspecified. And, uh, but, uh, but a person's patience can span a lifetime. And so, you know, patience is a word that represents this undetermined sort of amount of waiting and pausing and presencing, 
right? And um, uh, there are other values like that, very, a lot of aspirational values. Uh, for example, a lot of people want to earn lots of money or, or ha live in a big house. And, you know, those are aspirational values. There's these ideas, right, about what it would be like to be very wealthy or have lots uh, uh, or live in a, in a beautiful home on a hill, say. You know, who knows whether people will achieve these values. Uh, though, there's something about creating the vision, right? The vision, and it may be that the vision is never, ever achieved. Though, the consolation for that is that uh, it does sort of uh, attract us in a certain direction uh, to achieve a, a certain goal. You know, it Maybe we didn't achieve the goal 100% satisfactorily, uh, satisfactorily, but perhaps we achieved it 10%. And that might be good enough. Sure. Yeah, maybe we didn't have the mansion on the hill, but we were able to uh, purchase and secure a beautiful home um, in a thriving city. And, uh, you know, that was good enough. Yeah. You know, we may not all be millionaires or billionaires or trillionaires, but we maximize the money we have by saving it and spending wisely and earning as much as we can. Yeah. And so, you know, they are aspirational values. And in fact, I would guess that pretty much most values are aspirational. Uh, and, and what's great is that in our times, we do achieve values. We do achieve these things. Um, you know, I achieve values and secure values uh, every day. For example, food is an example. I, I eat all the calories I need to eat every day. And I drink all the water I need to drink every day. And so those are values that I secure, thankfully. <laughs> and... Um, you know, that's just the nature of values. So I appreciate what Louisa May Al Alcott had to say about values. So let's see, hear what Mary McKenzie has to say in her passage, which is subtitled, Connecting to Our Happiness. Are you feeling happy, content, or excited? Oh, and where'd my pen go? I'm not sure. I had a pen a moment ago. Hmm. Well, are you feeling happy, content, or excited? Since all feelings are the result of needs, consider which of your needs are connected to your happiness. Are your needs for love, fun, intimacy, caring, consideration, and challenge being met? Or is a different need behind your feelings? Every time you feel happiness, excitement, or love, your needs are met. Every time you feel sad, hurt, disappointed, or angry, they are not. It is important to look beyond feelings to needs. Whether we are happy or sad, this helps us continue, or this helps us connect to ourselves and how we meet or fail to meet our needs. Be aware of the met needs behind your feelings of pleasure or happiness today. So that's what the thought of the day is. Be aware of the met needs behind your feelings of pleasure or happiness today. So there's something really important that's coming up in my mind when I read this passage, and it's about this idea, she said it here, about how our feelings, she said it very starkly, right here. She says, um, since all feelings are a result of needs. I mean, she said it boldly right there. All feelings are the result of needs. And I think I'm going to respectfully disagree with that. <laughs> because I think feelings are the result of thoughts. That's right. And you might be thinking, well, how is a thought different from a need? Well, you know, there are objective needs. For example, your need for water. And there are thoughts about your need for water. So 
Mary McKenzie's hypothesis is that all our feelings result from objective needs, say, or maybe even subjective needs. Yeah. Um, though I would go so far as to say that it's not that deep at all, that it's mostly, it's mostly just our thoughts. And this is where I get this idea that our feelings can be mistaken. Um, because I think that we, if we think, say, we need water, we might think we need water, but objectively, we might not need it at all. Our bodies might be perfectly fine. <laughs> so we may, be, we may have fear that we're not getting the water that we need. And my suggestion is that that fear could be the result of just our fearful thoughts and not any actual need for water. <laughs> and um, I think this is an important distinction because I think it takes, I think people think of feelings as having a greater meaning or import than they actually do. Um, when, for me, when I think of a feeling being triggered by thoughts instead of needs, um, what that does is it means that, uh, that I basically question my thoughts. I uh, question whether my thoughts are accurate, an accurate reflection of reality. You know, a need, needs, uh, here's the thing. Some needs are objective and some needs are subjective. In fact, in some respects, they're all subjective. <laughs> um, so it's kind of slippery, but um, I guess the point I want to make is that it's, I don't think it's true that all needs, that all feelings are the result of needs, whether they're met or unmet. I think it's possible to have, uh, to think you have a need because of some errant thought and then, and being mistaken about your true needs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I don't know if that makes any sense or not, but uh, to me, it makes a lot of sense. To me, there's a pretty sharp distinction I think that we can be that you know whatever thoughts get fed into our mind. Let's say we let's say we watch a movie. You know, movies through the use of music and uh, form on the screen and storytelling and um, connotations, the words that are being used, those thoughts that are sort of being put into your mind through. Um, you know, the, the movie going, going to a movie, um, that those images on the silver screen can uh, create emotions in a person. And objectively, that person is just sitting in a dark room. <laughs> but, you know, the human mind can, um, you know, fantasize that there are certain needs uh, you know, emotions, basically emotions will pop up in while you're watching the movie. It could be fear, happiness, anger, sadness, um, jealousy, you know, can arise. And, you know, those feelings that are arising in our minds are real. It's just that they're, they don't represent reality. <laughs> uh, not the reality of your own. I mean, they represent some reality and that is sort of a, a reflection of what's going on on the screen, but they're not connected to your body in any way. Um, you know, I don't know. I guess there's this idea, and I'm having a trouble describing it, but you know, I do think that thoughts trigger, uh, create needs. And they, I do think that thoughts can create needs, even when there's no real actual need going on. And, you know, this comes, it goes a lot to, to this idea about how, you know, we create our own realities through, through uh, projecting our material onto the world. You know, we create our own heaven or hell by decisions we make about what thoughts we're going to consider during the day. You know, we 
human beings, we, we can focus and over-focus on ideas, on our values, and we can distort our perception of reality. And it happens in a way that's completely unconscious. Like, for example, I know a person who, in fact, I know a few people who sort of engage with reality through this lens of loss. You know, everything they see is a reflection of some kind of loss. Their, their minds just go there. They go to what's missing, right? And it's, you know, I can see how that's a very adaptive attitude to have, like what's missing, so that they can add what's missing, right? That makes a lot of sense. I can see how the self-care involved in that perspective. But what it also means is that these people are continually sad. <laughs> They're sad. They're continuously longing for a partner or a family or they're longing for mental health or they're longing for affection because all they see is loss. Or there's another person, all she sees is separation, isolation. You know, her mind goes there. She's even even among a group of people who love them. Within the group, she's telling stories about how she's isolated. Um, you know, these attitudes um, have a tendency to um, reinforce themselves. They're self-reinforcing, you know, if, and, and, and you can sort of go down the rabbit hole in a sense. And, you know, if you over-focus on something like loss, it'll color your whole life. And the emotions that you feel can be quite intense because you engage and re-engage and engage again with the same old the same old mental pathways of sensing loss and you know my heart goes out to these people who are suffering terribly because of it, their focus you know people who are anxious i know a person who's anxious they uh, focus on fear-inspiring things. You know, they're always looking for the threats. And they're always just asking themselves, well, is this a threat and how can it be a threat? And um, is this a threat to my friends? Is it a threat to me? And, you know, they're really focused on uh, risks, the risks that are all around them. And, and sometimes they over-focus on risks and their whole life becomes this whole risk-taking adventure, you know, where they're overcoming risk and dealing with death and problems with health. And, you know, and here's the thing. I mean, the story, the, the, the theme behind both these stories, the people who focus on loss and the people who focus on risk, that is create the creation of sadness and the creation of the emotion of fear. You know, they do it habitually. It's common for their minds. And um, that's, that's, the, that's the world that they see through their lenses. And so what I'm suggesting is that their needs, right? Their needs to protect from loss, their needs for wholeness, their needs to protect uh, risk from risk and, and their need for safety. Um, say, I guess their need for connection and their need for safety, those needs are amplified and in, in those people's lives. And it's arbitrary. It's completely arbitrary. There's no, there's no purpose or deeper meaning behind it other than the fact that that's where they're focusing in their lives right now. That's where they habitually focus. Or their neurology or their consciousness continually goes to questions about 
risk or questions about separation. And uh, it's just a habit. It's how they approach the world through these mental habits. And um, so those needs, I believe, are artificially created. You know, in some way, they're, in some ways, you know, I, they're an exaggeration. You know, I can see in some ways it's correct. You know, they are experiencing loss. Yeah. And they are experiencing risk. Absolutely. And they're also over-focusing on loss and risk, creating artificially intense emotions, artificially intense attitudes about the world because of where they're focusing their lives. And here's the, here's the thing. They could change those perspectives in an instant when, if they ever did, ever, ever, would, ever would decide to change, to focus on other things, you know, to focus on things. I think the idea in a human life is really to focus on pretty much everything in a moderate, consistent way. Move from subject to subject. In fact, the brain does that, does this infinitely well. It's got, in fact, it's got a, a judgment associated with it, with it. It's called monkey mind, right? This monkey mind is a lot of people complain about it, but I think it is exactly what gives us mental health. As we hop from subject to subject in our minds, we are doing the healthy thing. And that is focusing on one thing and then another and then another. That is the healthy thing. We're sampling our environments and uh, we're focusing on things in the moment. And if something is concerning, we'll focus on that for a little while, solve the problem. And then we'll return uh, to uh, a random sample of the world around us. And, you know, that creates, I think, a very neutral outlook. You know, this monkey mind saves us. It really does. I know a lot of people want to focus in, they want to be intent on one subject or another. But that creates distortions in the perception of reality. You know, I know a lot of people just want to, you know, they just want to, I don't know, they just want to, they want to solve what they think are serious problems. And anyway, uh, I think it's not entirely true that that's the case. So, anyway, I was uh, opining on the idea of, the idea that all feelings are the result of needs. I think all feelings are the result of thoughts. Okay. Well, let's get, uh, so it's uh, Christmas time and I picked up this book called Hark, a Christmas Sampler. And we've been discussing the origins of uh, the, the Christmas story uh, in particularly uh, origins relating to the different uh, plants, the Christmas plants. And uh, also yesterday we discussed something related to uh, the Christmas animals of uh, you know, the animals associated with Christmas. We talked about it yesterday. We talked about bees and how bees might be associated with Christmas. We talked about oxen and cattle, how they're associated with Christmas, about how cattle on Christmas Eve are, um, are thought to, um, speak like human beings <laughs> at midnight, <laughs> right? And uh, so we're going to move to other aspects of the Christmas mythos. We're going to talk about goats and reindeer today and how goats and reindeer are associated with Christmas. So I'm going to read a passage in my book about Christmas animals. And here we go. Goats play a large role in Scandinavian Christmas celebrations. In Sweden, the Yulebok or Yule Ram is said to butt any naughty children. <laughs> okay. So the goats butt naughty children in uh, Scandinavia, in Sweden particularly. Isn't that fascinating? To remind their children to be good, Swedish parents. Oh, to remind their children to be good, Swedish parents place a small straw goat in amongst the Christmas candles. In Norway, the Yule Ram 
is called Yule Book, and children leave out a dish of food for him Christmas Eve. If the dish is empty the next day, it means good luck. If it is filled with grain, there will be a fine crop. In Denmark, the Yule Ram is called Klapperbach, and he is a kind of hobby horse covered with goat skin and a ram's head made of paper or wool <clears throat> or wood. So the Yule Ram, I'll just say that again, in Denmark, the Yule Ram is called the Klapperbach, and he is a kind of hobby horse covered with goat skin and a ram's head made of paper or wood. Fascinating. So let's read a little bit about reindeer. Reindeer are newcomers to the Christian legend. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Before the 19th century, St. Nicholas rode on a donkey or a white horse, or even in a sky chariot pulled by great horses. In 1821, an American poem called The Children's Friend first introduced the idea of reindeer. Old Santa Claus, with much delight, his reindeer drives this frosty night. The next year, Bible scholar Clement Moore wrote a poem for his children called A Visit from St. Nicholas. And for the first time, the reindeer, now grown to eight, were named Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, Vixen, Comet, Cupid, Donner, Blitzen. Rudolph, the red-nosed reindeer, was created in 1939 by Robert L. May, who wrote the verse that was published in a booklet. Ten years later, cowboy singing star Gene Autry recorded a song based on that verse. Rudolph has been considered Santa's ninth and most important reindeer ever since. <laughs> wow, that is amazing stuff. Um, yeah, that is amazing. You know, it's interesting how this, le these le this legend of reindeer gets added to, right? Um, the legend starts off in 1821, uh, where um, uh, an American poem uh, cites this idea of reindeer driving Santa's sleigh. And then sometime later, 1939, you know, basically 108 years later, uh, Robert L. May writes uh, about it. And now, not only is it the reindeer, but we've also got Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, where, and we've got eight reindeer instead of just some random amount of reindeer. So isn't it interesting how this legend, it just, the legend, the parts are just get piled on over the years. There are people who add to the story. And, you know, it, it's, it's kind of amazing. It gives me a sense of power over the story. Like this idea that I can change the story, the legend of Santa Claus by, say, writing a good song or writing a good poem, one that's popular and one that sort of adds to the legend. And you and I have the power to change the Christmas legend if we wanted to. Now that, to me, is amazing. You know, it's interesting to me to think, too, that, you know, a lot of Christmas music, a lot of Christmas music that is considered classics, well, that music was created only 30 or 40 years ago, right? Relatively soon. You know, this Santa Claus legend has been going on for, I don't know, maybe a thousand years. Maybe less than that. <laughs> I'd like to know, um, well, maybe, yeah, maybe it's been about a thousand years. St. Nicholas was, uh, um, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, maybe 800 to a thousand years ago. So it's, it's amazing to me how these legends change over time and how quickly they change, how rapidly they change. It's not like they change. I mean, it... I mean, a hundred years to change the legend from some reindeer to eight reindeer and then adding Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. You know, that's something. It, it does take some time. You know, it's just amazing. It's funny how these details sort of enrich the story, right? They've got names now. Uh, Comet and Vixen and Donner and Dasher and uh, just amazing stuff. 
So yeah, I really like this idea about how legends can be changed and modified. You know, it's also a warning. Not only is it empowering to know that you or I could change a legend, say related to St. Patrick's Day or Valentine's Day or, or even Thanksgiving, uh, but it also serves as a warning about how these legends, you know, these holidays were created. You know, and I think it's it's important to have this perspective <coughs> that that if they don't necessarily represent the truth as it happened. You know, holidays are not documentaries. You know, they're not they're not historical interpretations of precisely what happened. Um, they're not accurate in any way. You know, they're sometimes there are there there are intents behind certain holidays that are political or economic or social. Um, and, you know, there's this mythos that is surround, that surrounds a certain situation and the legend grows and changes over time. It gets added on by other, by creative people. And, uh, you know, I think that the same can be true uh, as said of, of every legend. You know, of every holiday, I think there is some mythos. There is some storytelling. There is some artistry. And in fact, let me suggest that this idea can be expanded to culture in general, to society, just to how people live. These legends and mythos can change over time. And they're not necessarily a true reflection of reality. I mean, even news programs, right? Uh, when you watch the news, there are always interpretations uh, by the author, by and and it's always been the case. Even in scientific journals, you know, there are certain values that are <clears throat> transmitted through the story. You know, you can imagine even scientists; they are writing a story about the experiment that they performed. You know, they're trying to be as objective as they can, uh, but no matter what, you know, all human beings inject their values into the work that they do. And it, there's just no way around it. And you know, it's kind of interesting, this whole world that we live in that's really formed and created by words and images are really artistic descriptions of what is actually going on. <laughs> and we each, you know, to some, to one extent or another, add our own artistic flair to the world. And so, you know, in a, in a, in a very serious sense, living in the world is a lot like going to the museum where we walk from picture to picture and we see, uh, how say through an art gallery, we see how each artist has depicted reality around him. You know, there are some artists who are very good. They're very deft with language, very deft with imagery. There's some artists who are not so good. There's some artists who paint harsh pictures of reality and some who paint fanciful pictures of reality. And in a way, the, our lives are, are a movie where we are the artist who paints the picture of what's going on around us. And we tell the story to ourselves through our inner voice. You know, this is really important to know about, you know, and I'm really happy to be discussing this with you as your, as your father right now, Emily, this whole idea that there is an artistry, there's an art and everyone is an artist and how we are continually being, uh, ex exposed to other people's artistry about what's going on in the world. You know, these are the fabrications. Uh, these are the, uh, and it's even ourselves, even our own minds. We fabricate. This is how our life is going, right? We have a, we have statements that we tell ourselves. This is what's going on. This is what's happening. That these are artistic expressions. These are summations, basically summaries. You know, using the material that is present in our minds. Um, you know, expressing what we think our lives are about, right? And that's creating our sadness or our anger. 
and but at bottom it is our own artistic expression and uh you know you know and there are an infinite number there's a lot of freedom there's a lot of freedom i could i can choose to focus in on one aspect of reality or another you know there's a lot of freedom in that in a way i am an artist who is sort of painting a picture of or, or portrait of my of my life in the moment every moment as i talk to myself using my inner voice i'm a, using my words right as a writer and as a speaker to sort of tell myself what's going on and um this is a really important thing. It really talks to sort of the subjective nature of reality, even our own experience, right? Um, you know, let's say I end up in a hospital room. I wake up in the hospital room. What do I focus on? You know, do I focus on great gratitude about me breathing a breath and the miracle of being alive in the moment? Or do I freak out? <laughs> You know, these are decisions we make in the moment. Uh, and we make them uh, often quite unconsciously. And so what I'm trying to do now is I'm trying to bring this to your awareness. I'm making it, I'm making this conscious. This idea, I get this I, metaphor of a fish in a fishbowl. You know, the water is just part of the fish's experience. The fish may not even realize it's in water. Just like we don't realize that we are sunk in an atmosphere, we're sort of floating in an atmosphere of gases, right? Nitrogen and oxygen. We forget it's just because the gases in our atmosphere are just so familiar. We've had them in our atmosphere um, our entire lives and we easily dismiss them, you know? I think it's important to acknowledge that just as the fish is in water and just as human beings are in an atmosphere, human beings also create their own reality. Now, when I say that, it doesn't mean that they create their objective reality. The objective reality is the objective reality. It's what it is. But what I'm talking about is human beings create the thoughts that overlay objective reality. We create those thoughts and, and, the thoughts are the artistic expression on top of objective reality. I do believe that objective reality exists. <laughs> Certainly, as a scientist, um, I believe objective reality exists. And, um, and, uh, and I also recognize that my consciousness overlays thoughts on top of reality. For example, this idea of purple or red, right? All the colors, like the colors don't exist in the world, right? Now, wavelengths of light exist in the world, but our brain and its chemical formulations in you know, the retina and the nervous impulses create the imaginary color purple, the imaginary color red and blue out of the different wavelengths of light. So the, the wavelengths uh, of light uh, bouncing around are objectively true, but the color blue or red, those colors are completely imaginary, <laughs> right? They are what our brain has come up with to, um, to sort of help us experience the reality of different wavelengths. And really light has no color. There is no color associated with uh, wavelengths of light. There's just no red. Red is complete fabrication. <laughs> uh, you know, you can you can verify this by by recognizing that there are people who are colorblind, and there are people who have never seen the color red. And um, anyway, um, so I guess what I want to emphasize is this idea of about manufacturing. We manufacture our own reality. And um, that is a very empowering message. Again, I'm really happy to relay this information to you as father to you, my daughter, Emily. And that is, you know, that's a very empowering message. It means that 
uh, in some respects, we are the creators of our own reality. We are gods in, the, in one sense, where we create our own reality. We create our own experience. And a lot of that is a function of the decisions we make about how we relate to our world. You know, it's really our choice, our choice about how we enjoy our day or not. You know, how much happiness we experience. You know, they are related to the choices we make. And um, anyway, okay, I think I've uh, <laughs> I finished uh, that particular expression and I'm ready to move on to something else. So let's go on to the uh, questions. Um, golly. Oh, here we go. So here's, uh, now, here's a bunch of questions. And the reason I'm answering these questions is because I want you to get to know me a little bit better. So I'm hoping that, um, golly. <laughs> okay. So I'm hoping that, um, by watching this video, you'll be able to learn a little bit more about me. So here's question number 227. Do you believe we will ever meet aliens during your lifetime? And my, my answer is, yeah, yes, yes, I do think we will. Now, um, aliens, now I don't, I don't even dream for a moment that we will see aliens in the sense of people walking around, <laughs> you know, uh, the, the common mythical alien. No, like E.T., extra, Steven Spielberg type aliens. I don't think we'll see those. I am hopeful what we will see are maybe, maybe not even bacteria with cell walls. Um, and maybe even not plant life. Nothing, maybe nothing with a cell wall. But I can imagine seeing strands of RNA strands of RNA sort of multiplying, maybe without a cell membrane. I could imagine us seeing very simple forms of life, life just beginning in places like, say, underneath the crust of Mars, or, yeah, particularly Mars or any other planet, like one of the moons of Jupiter, perhaps. Um, I can definitely, I can Im imagine us seeing microbes that are out there. Now we've already seen organic molecules, uh, of various types on asteroids and, uh, in other places. And I think that we'll see more things. And when I say organic molecules, I, I'm thinking might, we might even see sugars. Yeah. To me, that would be amazing that if we could... And I think in my lifetime, we'll definitely see something a lot related to that. Maybe not strands of DNA, but more complex biological um, related chemicals. Um, next question, question number 228. Do you believe in conspiracy theories? Okay, I don't. That's a really easy question. I don't believe in conspiracy theories. And the reason I don't is because often they're unverifiable. Quite often, when it comes to conspiracy theory, there is a part of the theory that um, calls uh, out this whole idea that somebody's trying to keep a secret. It's, and there's also this idea about how it's impossible to know the truth. Um, and uh, in a way, believe it or not, that actually de, uh, what should I say, delegitimizes the theory itself. I'm a sort of a verificationist, and if a theory can't be verified, to me, it loses any power of explanation. You know, without any ability to verify, it's not explanatory. So in my mind, conspiracy theories are not explanatory. <laughs> they have the appearance of, there's sort of like phantasms where, you know, they're an illusion. They provide an illusion of an explanation, but there's no explanation there. They're sort of like tautologies. Anyway, next question. Uh, question number 230. Do you believe the government keeps dangerous or curious secrets from the public? <laughs> dangerous or curious secrets from the public. 
you know, I don't care for the wording of this question. <laughs> Certainly the government has secrets, every government does, um, and that is known. Um, question number 231, did you ever like Pokemon? Yeah, I sure do like Pokemon. Um, did you ever like Pokemon? Oh yeah, I like Pokemon right now. In fact, um, I, uh, I've been playing Pokemon the card game and I've got a couple decks of Pokemon cards and I'm excited to um, play Pokemon uh, with you. If you have any interest in playing Pokemon, I'd be happy to um, pull out my decks of cards. Um, I would. I used to play uh, Pokemon down at uh, Metro Entertainment down in Santa Barbara, and I'm um, really enjoying. Uh, sort of, uh, I, I enjoyed playing Pokemon, and I have friends who've collected Pokemon cards of various types, and so yeah, I'm into it. Now I, I've also played Pokemon video games, like on the Super Nintendo. I was playing Pokemon. Or was it, oh no, it was my on my Game Boy, I was playing Pokemon. I didn't find the Pokemon video games to be very good. I did, I just never, there was a lot of fighting, right? Apparently there's a lot of fighting in Pokemon and um, I just didn't get it. And I didn't really appreciate it. And um, so, so yeah, I do like Pokemon. I'm now on a scale from one to 10, my interest level in Pokemon is not that high right now. I would say if 10 is the greatest interest, my interest in Pokemon is only about a one right now. You know, it might be a two right now. Um, I, I do have an interest in playing Pokemon uh, on my smartphone. I think it's called Pokemon Go. I might go ahead and pull that up and uh, try to play that a little bit. I've heard some good reviews about it. Next question, question number 232. Do you follow recipe books? Well, I have a few recipe books and I pretty much don't follow them. <laughs> you know, it really goes down to me following recipes at all. I do my best to follow as closely as I can recipes, but um, you know, for me, cooking is an artistic expression. And so I enjoy uh, cooking and you know sometimes you don't have every ingredient in a recipe that you want to perform and so you know I do the best I can what's the next question uh, question number 233 233 can you keep a secret uh, yes I can question number 234 do you have any secrets do I have any secrets? Well, I don't care for that question either. Um, I don't know. Question number 235. <laughs> any secret you would like to take to your grave? <laughs> Man, I don't care for this question at all. Question number 236. Are you a science fiction fan? Uh, yeah, I enjoy science fiction. I particularly enjoy, say, Star Trek, The Next Generation. Um, I enjoy, um, you know, Jean-Luc Picard and, uh, I do, I also enjoyed Battlestar Galactica when that series was out. So yeah, I really do like science fiction. Um, in fact, a lot, there have been a lot of interesting science fiction movies coming out lately. Um, uh, like I think there was one about Mars or something, The Martian. That was pretty good. Um, okay, question number 237. Are you a horror fan? No, I'm not. I really am not. Um, you know, I can see the appeal of horror. And in a way, it, it draws me in just a little bit, like 10%. You know, I sort of dip my toe into horror films, and then I almost immediately pull my toe out. <laughs> and I give up. You know, you know, I could the ideas that ho the horror genre treats are intriguing and interesting, but at the same time, for me, I, it's kind of like, I don't want to spend my time too much on it. It's just, I don't think it's necessarily the most 
healthy pastime to have. So, no, I don't indulge in horror. I don't read horror uh, novels or in, indulge in books relating to horror. Question number 238, are you into drama? And no, I'm really not into drama. You know, for the same reason, it has to do with tension. I'm just not a fan of subjecting myself to tension in stories unnecessarily. You know, directors and producers and special effects artists and, and musicians today, when they put together a film and they want to create tension, they have very subtle and effective ways of sort of making the audience feel, feel tense. And they are very effective. And, you know, it just seems like you're, uh, you're sort of putting yourself in a stressor position. You're sort of exposing yourself to a stressor. You know, these movies are very good. They're very well done. They're very entertaining. And they're also not my, my, my kind of thing. They're not my cup of tea. I much prefer a comedy or a romantic comedy or some family picture, at least now. Maybe when I was younger, I liked the horror genre a little bit, but I don't know. Nowadays, now I will take a horror film if it is a campy film. That is, if there are funny aspects of it. I, I can definitely see a movie like that. Um, but one, one thing I do find is that those films that say reference other horror films, I don't get what the references are. And so it's, I think those films are a little bit less entertaining, but they still could be funny just by how odd they are. Okay, question, next question. Question number 239, what makes a movie special? Hmm. Well, I think movies are special when they have a particular meaning or theme that is, um, that I can appreciate. Um, movies are special when I also, you, uh, when, a movie is special when you sort of are engaged with the movie and engaged with the characters, engaged with the story somehow, that you sort of become one or relate to that story or that, that story relates to your life in a significant way. You know, uh, a, a movie that has meaning um, is important. That is a movie that has meaning to me. It may not be popular uh, in uh, with audiences in the theater, but if there sometimes there might be an element that I'm working on that I can personally, from a personal growth standpoint, and I can relate to that element in that movie, then yeah, that movie becomes great to me and special. Next question. Question number 240. What makes a TV show brilliant or unique? Well, you know, first of all, I don't own a television set. <laughs> so I don't really watch TV, but I do watch YouTube videos. So I can say, I, I can reinterpret that question to mean what makes a YouTube video brilliant or unique? <laughs> well, you know, often I think it has to do with the content. Uh, is the content unique? Is it a different approach on some type of subject matter or some topic of interest? Um, are there connections that the um, YouTuber has made that you haven't heard before? Is it a learning ex learning experience? So different perspectives, different learning experiences. Um, also, you know, production value. There's something to say about production value. I really appreciate high resolution, good sound, good lighting, um, images that are in tight folk and good focus, uh, re rich colors, sound that is loud enough. And, uh, you know, I appreciate all those elements and that goes into what makes a YouTube video great. Next question. Do you read your horoscope? I don't, I don't believe in astrology. Question number 242. Have you ever had a tarot or card reading? Mm. That's a good question. I think I've had amateur tarot card readings. Um, 
Mm -hmm. uh, but I think they were limited, limited in scope. Next question. Question number 243. Do you read the newspaper? You know, I do and I don't. I read news articles that are posted on the internet. And on occasion, I will read newspaper articles. In fact, recently I've had this hankering, this interest in reading the newspaper lately. Uh, and I can read it very conveniently on my Kindle, my ebook reader. And uh, so I think I'm going to do that. I really do have an interest these days. I might pick up a copy of the New York Times or the Washington Post. Those are my two favorite newspapers, by the way. <laughs> and uh, uh, get to reading something about what's going on in the world. You know, I'm thinking, too, about how it would be useful to read something out of National Geographic. You know, they've got some really good articles, even despite, you know... See, the Kindle doesn't really uh, have, um, it can't really display photographs in color. And so a magazine like National Geographic, you know, I wouldn't necessarily be able to fully appreciate because the pictures aren't there. Um, now, if I had a tablet computer, and I, if I had a tablet, you know, I'd be able to uh, look at the colors on the photographs, uh, in the photographs better. I don't actually own a tablet. I've been really thinking hard about getting a tablet, though. I just haven't made the, taken the plunge yet. Okay, question number 244. Do you enjoy theme parks? <sighs> yes. I enjoy theme parks. I like Disneyland and Disney World. I've been to Knott's Berry Farm, and I've been to SeaWorld and Legoland. I've been to a lot of these theme parks with you. And I really enjoy theme parks. I think they're a lot of fun, a great way to spend the day. I have been thinking about going to um, Universal Studios and seeing the Harry Potter display that's out there. I think there is um, um, a Harry Potter world out there at Universal Studios, and I would sure like to visit it. I think they sell things like butter beer and you know, you get to see the broomsticks and the sorting hat. And I think it would be fun to go uh, shopping for um, magic wands. That sounds like fun. I think it's called Diogen Alley. Diogen Alley. Yeah, that's something I'd like to do. Question number 245. Oh, you know what? I think I'll pause right here. Emily, thank you for spending this time with me. Thank you for the intention of wanting to get to know me a little bit better. Thank you for, you know, just being you. You know, you really don't have to do anything I appreciate your presence in your life because of the meaning of the meaning it gives to me and I think it helps give me a little more direction about what to do and even how to do it and I really appreciate you know the the how I'm growing as a person in your presence and um, I want to thank you for all the benefits that you've given me over the years in terms of helping me develop my compassion and patience and even my communication skills. These skills that I've developed have a lot to do with, with you and uh, I want to just convey my deep and sincere appreciation for you. <laughs> 